Everyone, welcome to another episode of the Broken Meeple. This is the UK Games Expo review, and as I did with my preview, this is going to go out both on audio and also on video form. So you will see that this will be put onto both channels. And even though some of you will be listening to this on audio form, I do beg and urge you to watch this as a video as well, because there's going to be B-roll footage uh, going through this video, um, and if you don't know what that means, it basically means uh, video footage in the corner of the screen with no sound. And there will also be some audio, you know, videos as well, which you can listen to, but you won't necessarily be able to see what's going on. So I do urge you to watch this video at some point, but at least you might be able to get a gist of what's going on from the audio footage as well. So the UK Games Expo is over again. Yes, three and a half days of just fun. Absolute fun. I go up there on the press event on the Thursday evening, and then I spend Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in full at the expo, just doing what everyone else is doing, shopping around for games, uh, demoing games, meeting people, just generally having a good time. And again, this was no exception. The UK Games Expo is definitely one of my favorites, if not probably my the favorite convention I get to go to. You don't tend to find a lot of new releases like you know the hardness there, but everybody I know just congregates there. It's a friendly atmosphere. It's not too big for its britches, but it's sizable enough that there's plenty to do throughout the weekend. You know, there isn't a time when you should be like completely bored. And chances are you won't get to see everything while you're there anyway. So you should be able to see all the stuff that you want to see but then still have some bits left over. You know, there's so much to do, but it makes for a quality, quality weekend. And in order to do this video, it's um quite surprising. I actually, for once, have a script. Well, I say script, an outline of what it is I need to talk about because I had to look through all the footage that I took during the weekend and there was a bit to sift through. I took quite a bit. So I obviously need to have some idea as to what I'm kind of referring to. So, you know, more on that later. But basically what I was doing was I was going around with a, a, DJI, a DJI Osmo Mobile uh, gimbal. Basically, it's a phone stabilizer. So you attach your phone to it, you carry it around with essentially like holding a joystick in your hand and it allows you to sort of pan the phone around while it's filming, while you've got the camera on, tilt it up and down, tilt it left to right. And the idea is, is that it takes cinematic videos in the sense that if I was to do it with just my hand, I'd be jerking around like this, like crazy. Whereas if I have it on the gimbal, they should be a lot smoother and the transitions should be a lot smoother as well. Now, I'm not gonna say that's the case 100% of the time because this is the first time I've ever used it. I've had it for months never had the time to practice with it. So I decided right now I am gonna do it for the expo. I'm gonna take it with me and this will be its first test drive. And it turned out pretty well actually. It's not too intrusive, it's not too hard to carry around. Granted, I should have maybe taken the case with me a bit more often, but oh well, you know, you live and learn. 
but when I say the case, I mean like the stand, sorry, you know, the stand that you can put it on. Uh, so unfortunately it doesn't have a an auto panning function on it, or at least I haven't found one where it can just tilt by itself, but you could at least put it on the stand, have it focused on the board and then just leave it there. Whereas normally I have to hold it in my hand and then play the game with one hand, which is a little bit fiddly. It does make some of the videos look almost a bit like Rado style, Rado runs through, but if you're used to that style, then fair enough. You know, I'm hopefully gonna use this device in the future to do uh, solo playthrough videos by request. Obviously, do I put it on the stand or do I hold it in my hand and do it like Rado? You give me some feedback, you know, which do you reckon you prefer? Anyway, I digress, that's another topic for another time. So, in general, Expo, positive for the most part. There are some issues, I'll get onto those in a minute, but generally, if you want to play lots of games, you want to see games that aren't necessarily new, but also have been released, but you may not have got round to seeing, there's certainly plenty to do, and I recommend that if you are interested in games, that you find a chance to get to this convention, because it's just so worth it. However, there are some cons. First up, price. The price of the convention itself is relatively cheap, but the issue you have is hotels. Hotels are getting stupidly expensive at the expo because they've all sort of caught on to the fact that we all want to go here on this particular date. So all the Hilton, the Ibis Styles, the Arden, the Novotel, um, all of them are starting to jack up their prices like ridiculous levels. We're talking like £200 a night in some places. What? And that is just ridiculous. Shame on you hotels. You know, I stayed in the Hilton before and that was fairly expensive. This year I stayed in the Ibis Styles and that was getting pretty expensive as well. That was like £100 a night and it's for a basic hotel. It's not exactly the Ritz, is it? So next year, as I was booking for next year, because honestly, if you have not booked a hotel for next year's expo, you really should get on that right now because they sell out pretty quickly. Uh, you, know, you can find out the dates for the new one. I believe it's the 31st of May to the 2nd of June next year. So those are some dates you should bear in mind. Get booking your hotel now. Or in my case, bed and breakfast. I've already booked a bed and breakfast near Solihull, I think it's pronounced, I forget, but you know, in a small village nearby. It's right next to the train track though, which is a four minute walk to the train track, a three minute train ride to the NEC center, and there I am at the convention. It's as about as fast as it takes me to walk from the Ibis to the NEC center itself. And yet, I get a bed and breakfast with cooked breakfast, just two guest rooms, so I don't have to worry about noise everywhere, quiet night's sleep in a quiet location, you know, no rustle and bustle outside or hotel air conditionings to work, worry about, and 60 pound a night. Sweet result, I say. So that's my plan for next year anyway, and I get to still game until about 11.30 at night. Let's face it, after a long day at the expo, I'm kind of ready for bed by then, so it's not a massive deal that I gotta get the last train back. The other cons that I will mention is uh, the bring and buy works well, and there's a lot of great volunteers who run it. You know, fair credit to you. But you gotta be careful. The, the queues for the bring and buy were a little bit insane at times, particularly if you waited until the last minute to either get into the buy section or to sell or cash in for your games. Certainly, I don't think there's any way they can really improve it, to be honest. You know, they can make it bigger, but it's always gonna be full. There's only so many people that can do shifts, and there's a lot of people that wanna go around the bring and buy, so there's only so much you can do for that. And the only other con I will mention is that I thought the gaming libraries were a little bit lackluster this year. Maybe all the good games were taken out, but I don't know what the Hilton one was like, because I didn't go into the Hilton at all this time. But the one in the NEC Center, it was lacking in some good games. I mean, I, I was struggling to find anything that was either recent or even heard of. It was like looking at a charity shop with the games that you've never heard of in your life that nobody would know how to play, and... It was just bleh, it wasn't that great. I was lucky enough to find a copy of Sushi Go and Alt Olympics there, but it turned out all the decent games had either been taken off the shelf or just weren't there in the first place. And I didn't take any of my own games with me. None of these came with me. I had to carry two bags full of, I, you know, two IKEA bags full of games just to get there with the bring and buy. And they all sold, hooray! Yes, I sold every single game. But it meant that I couldn't bring my own games. And maybe I should have brought a few, you know, maybe a few portable ones. I don't know, but it's more stuff to carry. And I don't like carrying anything unless I've got a backpack. So, you know, it's, it's kind of hit and miss either way. 
So apart from those few cons, you know, the hotel price has been expensive, the gaming library and the bring and buy being a little bit hard to manage, the rest of the convention is solid though. You've got great publishers, great people, great, you know, guests, you know, for the most part, hee <laughs> And, you know, you've got all the games in the world that you can demo, you can get into, although, I will say to publishers, maybe this is another con, but it really depends on the publisher. Don't give the games to your demo people at the last second, please. Really don't. You know, I'm, it's getting grating to go to a demo area, sit down to want to demo a game, and you realize that the person who is gonna teach you has only seen the game for a total of 30 minutes. Because you pretty much only gave them a copy of the game whilst at the convention. So they haven't had a chance to learn it and get into a position where they can teach it. So they're constantly referring from rule books or they're forgetting key rules. And for certain gateway games, it's not such a problem. But you try teaching something heavier if you've not played the game before. You need to have your volunteers clued up on these games before you send them in to demo people. Because nothing turns you off a game faster than someone not being able to teach it well to you. And yeah, I get it, you want to be secretive about a few games, you know, like, I didn't want Eastern Wonders to be given to the public, you know, therefore I'll only show it to them now, but you gotta realise that's gonna impact on your volunteers' ability to teach demos, and it's not their fault. I mean, I can't learn most of these games in 30 minutes and be expected to teach it over and over and over again. You need time to prepare, so, you know, food for thought, publishers. Anyway, that's enough about the intro for the Games Expo. It's time to talk a little bit more about, you know, specific areas. So for the first, I'll talk about just people in general. If you want to meet some of the friendliest people ever, go to this convention. Honestly, everybody who's walking around is just so friendly. We're all there to enjoy games, we're all there to get into the hobby, and I was meeting all sorts of people just wandering around. Not even like people who were looking for me or I looking for them, just people at stands. They were just generally friendly. Like I'd be at a retailer stand and I'd hear somebody ask a question like, you know, which one would be better for us? You know, Eldritch Horror, Arkham Horror, you know, or, you know, what do you know about this game? And if I hear that the retailer doesn't know, because you can't know everything, then I jump in, I give some advice, the retailer's grateful, they're grateful, we have a bit of a two-way conversation about games and who we are, and everyone just shakes hands and is really friendly. It's such a welcoming environment. And I will say, definitely, and this wasn't just when I was helping out the Dice Tower, more on that later, but when I was on their booth or when I was just walking around, the people who came up to me and just shook my hand, you know, said hi, you know, I've read your stuff, I like your podcast, I like your videos, you know, thank you so much for that, honestly. It was really touching at times to hear what you had to say, because some of you had some great constructive feedback about what could be improved, you know, or what you really liked. There was a lot of people that liked the idea of being like, honest with the in and integrity and stuff, which really does sing to my heart, honestly, it does, because that's kind of what I'm going for with this. I don't want to hold back. If I love a game, I will sing the praises off the nearest mountaintop. But if I hate a game, I will rant about it until my throat dries up and becomes sore. You know, because I don't have to pander to any publisher, designer, network, or anything. I can be my own person and just give my own opinion. And then you can take what you want from that. You don't have to necessarily follow the opinion, but you can at least, you know, just hear what I have to say and then make up your own mind. That's always the way with this. But the feedback I was getting was just so nice. I mean, there were people I'd never met before who I knew listened to it, and you know, when me and other content creators do this sort of thing, it's very time consuming, it can get very demoralizing at times, you know, when you get like negative feedback, it can just be a big burden, a stressful burden to do. You know, you gotta record all this, you gotta get the equipment, set yourself up, edit it. It all takes time out of your daily life, and for people like me and others, we have full-time jobs. I mean, I envy the people who can do this as a full-time job and get paid for it and survive on that money. But for most of us, we can't, particularly people like me who are small fry. We have to do a full-time job in order to get paid, in order to live and buy games. But this is all just a hobby. No, I don't get paid for this. I get a few review copies every now and again, but that's it. I don't get paid, so and I don't get extra spare time to do it. So I have to do it when I can. So when people like you come up to me and just say nice things about what I'm doing, you know, the podcast, the videos, etc., it just rekindles that spark 
for me to continue on and to keep this going and to make it better. So thank you so much from my heart for you know just turning up and saying hi and even just spending a minute or so, you know, just to chat. You know, there's nothing better than a decent chat with friendly gamers. And one of you even got me to sign your magazine, which threw me off as well, because it's like, what? But what do you want me to sign something for? I'm just me. I don't know. But, you know, I was more than grateful once we found a pen that could work. Stupid glossy magazines. Anyway, but, you know, people in general that were there, you know, there was a lot of good guests. You know, you had Rado running around, you know, helping out the Geekazon crowd. You know, all of them were there. There was a lot of famous people that you know from publishers, like, uh, you know, Ignacy Trevajet, for example, was there for Portal. <laughs> once the Portal people arrived, they had some uh, flight troubles. And, um, of course... The Dice Tower were there. I was there on the Dice Tower booth helping out every now and again. It's what I do each time now. You know, they put out a schedule asking for hourly shifts and I set myself up doing, say, two hours a day to help them out. But to be honest, by the time I get to the end of the convention, I usually stick around for a bit longer because, well, I've done what I need to do. And it's just nice to stay on that booth because, again, you get to chat to people, you get to say hi and... Whilst helping out on the booth, I get to chat to Tom Vassell, Z Garcia. Sadly, Sam Healy was not there for the expo, but, you know, he was there in our hearts. You know, we wish him, we, he, he, it wasn't a bad thing that he wasn't there in terms of his own thing. It's just his uh, children were graduating. So he needed to be home for that. You know, pretty good reason to skip the expo, if you're pretty honest. But hopefully we'll see him next year. It'll be good to see you again, Sam. You know, take it from me on that. But even while there, you know, I had um, Anna Vassenberg, um, sorry if I mispronounced your name, <clears throat> on the booth with me a lot. You know, she's a lovely, friendly girl. You know, she does some content for Board Game Blender, I think, uh, specifically. But she's really lovely, really cheerful, you know, great person to sit with. There was uh, somebody who wasn't even on the Dice Tower Network, Jason, who, you know, just was a friendly chap. He was purely there for, well, he was, he was in the country for work. So he basically just turned up at the expo and just wanted to help out. He wasn't there to buy games as such, or he wasn't there to, you know, necessity. Like he's not a con contributor to the network. He just wanted to help out. Sweet, good on you, man. It was good to meet you, and you know, hopefully we'll see you again next time. And of course, you've got everybody. You know, you've got the uh, Amy and Fiona from the Game Shelf. You had Mike Barnes from Who Dares Rolls, Paul Grogan. Um, oh god, I got to remember them all. Uh, yeah, Creaking Shelves. Yeah, there was all sorts. Uh, Dave Loser. I'm trying to remember them all. It's so hard to remember all these people, but there were so many great like guests and publishers and designers there. You know, even got to have a little meal with Martin Wallace, which I got to admit, as you might guess, for me is kind of ironic, isn't it? You know, the one person in the world who you know is not a fan of Martin Wallace games, and I get to sit down and have a meal with him, and he's such a friendly bloke. I felt so bad. You know, I'm sitting next to this guy. And we're just eating like a pasta meal, and you know, he's chatting about just general things in gaming. You know, his opinion and that. And you know, he's very friendly, very talkative, and generally a nice guy. And I'm like, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to like rag on your game so much. You know, but I mean, I still stand by. I'm not a fan of his games, but you know, that's just an opinion of his games. He himself is a great person. So yeah. Generally, really enjoyed myself, and you know, I didn't take in many shows. I must admit, during the event, I would I don't tend to go to a lot of the shows because mainly just time. But I always make certain to turn up to the Dice Tower live show, and boy, <laughs> when they put that on YouTube, I certainly recommend you go and watch it. It was hilarious, honestly. I mean, there's some you know, I'll show you some footage in a second of uh, like. A, almost like the intro to it as they were getting started, but it was Tom, Z, and Dave Luzo doing top 10 games that they like, but they suck at. This was such a funny list. I was in hysterics for most of the time, more so than most of their other live lists, and, you know, I got to go up to the stand at the very end in order to give my view, and so did a lot of other people, and in my defense, I know I like doing that, but it was that or they left early, because... Normally, when they ask for people to come up, it's usually like, oh, there's a bit of a queue. But for some bizarre reason, they asked, and I looked around, and nobody had their hand up. And I didn't want to be the first. I didn't want to be like the, ooh, ooh, teacher, pick me, pick me, you know, kind of person. But nobody was saying anything. And I'm like, I've been thinking all this about one to say. I need to go up eventually, but I don't want to be eager beaver. Give it time, somebody else will go first. Be polite, somebody else will... Maybe it's a British thing to do, I don't know. But 
nobody was putting a hand up. So I was like, okay, I'll do it then. And so I went up, gave my spiel, and, you know, all went well. And during my time up there, suddenly one person and another person and another person. So essentially they were looking for a scapegoat to open the floodgates. <laughs> That's essentially what I did. As soon as I went up there, suddenly another, what, like 10 people went up there and gave their thoughts and some great ones to hear about. But I certainly recommend you watch that video when the Dice Tower uploaded it. It was just so good to listen to. Hi everyone. Sam wasn't able to make it because his kids are graduating or have graduated. Congratulations to them at this mm -hmm. point in time. Um, so Dave stepped in. We asked about what, 20, 30 people. Oh, yeah, at least. <laughs> yeah, Dave eventually. Yeah. That's how it usually works. No, we usually ask more, but we were kind of. <laughs> okay, so uh, first of all, before we get into this, uh, I want to say thank you for all those who came. Thank you if you came by the booth. We really appreciate that. Thank you for how nice you are to us here. The trip was good, <laughs> mostly. We like it here. I don't have a favorite game from the convention yet. <laughs> the best thing about the convention is meeting you all, and yes, it's bigger. But that's actually fact. You didn't have to ask us for that one. <laughs> like, is it bigger? Like, yeah, it's bigger. Um, but it is a lot of fun. And we, we kid, you can ask us those questions, I know. I know when you go up, sometimes it's like, oh, what do you say to this person? Yeah. You know, you're so tall, Tom. <laughs> you are so tall. But no one says tall. They would say big. You're so big. <laughs> big. Thank you. It's America. <laughs> All right, so we're doing our uh, top ten. So, okay, tell me, we got this title right. It's top fun games we suck at. Yeah, that's it. That's okay. it. That's well, right. top 10 games at which we suck, if you want to speak English <laughs> like they do here. All right, we'll, we'll fix that in post. All right, so yeah, so uh, people are... And once we were done with the expo, you know, myself, Tom and Z, and various other people from the network, so we had Jason, we had uh, Anna, we had um, Efka and Elaine from No Pun Included, we had Dave Loser, you know, we had a lot of cool people who went out for a meal, we went out for a burger meal, and also went to the cinema to watch Solo, which I posted my views on Facebook recently. It's a, uh, it's decent, it's a decent heist movie, but it really should just not have Star Wars in the title, because I think the stuff to do with Star Wars kind of ruins it, whereas I think it was it's just its own sci-fi universe heist film, it would actually be pretty decent. So, like I say, it was all good, and I think I had one of the biggest Sundays I've ever had at a cinema <laughs> at the time as well, so... Yeah, my stomach regretted it, but mmm, tasted good. So the first part of the expo in general was Thursday evening, which was the press event. This is where me and a bunch of other content creators and media publishers go around part of the NEC hall, like the open gaming area, where loads of publishers and designers have set up little mini stands to showcase like the new hotness that they're producing. This was twice as big as last time. I'm not kidding. Last year, it's getting bigger each time, but this time it's like, I've only got two hours, there's no way I can talk to every one of these people. So you have to cherry pick the ones that you want, and I feel so bad when you're, you're hunting down the person that you want, and then somebody notices you literally glance at their table, and they instantly try to talk you in, like a typical like car salesman effectively, to get you to be interested in what they're doing, and you don't have an interest. It's so hard, it feels like such a, I feel like such a jerk at that time, but you can't help it. You know, somebody might be trying to suck, you know, not suck them in, sorry, that's very bad words. You know, might be trying to entice me into liking their new RPG system. But I've given up RPGs. I haven't done an RPG in years. It's not what I'm there to do. And so I don't want to sort of say to them, sorry, I'm not interested in RPGs, because they're being passionate about what they have created, what they want to do. And therefore, I want them to be passionate. I want them to get that info out. But the press event itself was good fun. I got to talk to a lot of uh, designers and publishers about the new hotness that they were doing. I took some videos. You know, I'll, I'll put up one or two in this particular segment. But, uh, you know, the audio on my phone is only so good. It's better than I thought, actually. It's got a noise-canceling mic on it. And you can actually hear the person teaching you on the other end, providing they speak loud enough. 
might be a little quiet at times, but hopefully some of this footage will, you know, see you through. Um, but generally the event was good. I got to see a lot of different games being done, you know, get some information, and it was like a good hmm, taster of what there was to come. So check out this footage and, you know, of one or two demos being done and, you know, see what you think. So you've got the wood carving your village. By the time we get to the second market, which marks the end of the game, you're going to total up everything again, so everything can potentially score two times. Right. Um, but in this market phase, we're also going to score these conditional ones, which are your real sort of points, score, big points scores. Oh, okay. um, so the wood carver gives you gold equal to the, to the gold printed on your wood villages, so that one is going to score that one again. Yeah. And any other green cards that have got gold printed. Yeah. Right, so at the very, very beginning of the game, you flip the uh, first top couple of cards of the scenario deck and it will give you an introduction to read out to everybody else. Mm -hmm. So the introduction to scenario one is where they will say, it's, uh, it, it's exactly what I told you, the P60 and we know this one. You then get a uh, card that gives you the modifications to set up the rules and then the objective and the ten different scenarios each have a different objective. So far, it plays out over 13 rounds which is uh, the 13 days that Billy has left to live. <laughs> and every round is made up of three different shifts. We reveal the cards one by one, and then the shift manager for each round assigns workers to each shift. The people who are then assigned to the shift... But of course, I bet you don't want to just hear about me like praising people and you know talking about press and all that lot. You want to hear about my thoughts on some of the games, don't you? That's what you're really here for, admit it. Well... Yep, this is the section where I'm going to do just that. Now, I have footage and photos of this, so like I say, I urge you to watch the video as well as listen to the podcast. However, I don't have sound audio for all of them. Some of them where you can hear the other person teaching or, other, or me talking quite clearly, I've kept them and you'll see clips. But there are times where the other person was talking too softly or there was a bit too much background noise, and so I felt it was better to not have the audio in those vids. So those ones you'll just see as B-roll footage in the corner of the screen, but the ones where I felt the audio was decent, you'll see a short clip of what it was I was playing here. However, I'm not just going to use this review to do those videos, because some of them are, you know, I, I was recording for a good few minutes, five to ten minutes on certain games, and I feel that, you know, you want to see the whole lot. So what I'm going to do is you'll see clips on this show, but I will put up in a playlist on my YouTube channel of the full videos. So uncut, you know, no special treatment or anything, just literally this was the video file for particular games, providing the audio was good enough, and I'll put them on this well. There's not going to be loads because I was only doing so many of those, but, you know, what I do have, I will put up for your benefit. So, the first game I want to talk about very quickly is Harvest Dice. This isn't a new hotness, it was out last year, and it's a roll and write game. You essentially have a, a sort of farmyard of a, a vegetable patch, effectively. And the idea is, is that you will roll these different colored dice, you have three colors for tomatoes, lettuce, and carrots, and you have a grid map to show your vegetable patch. And as you draft a dice, you must you know, write or draw, essentially, the vegetable that corresponds to in that space on your grid. Your vegetables must stay together, so your carrots must be in one batch, and your, uh, you know, your tomatoes must be in one place, etc. And if you can't place something, then you give it to this cute little pig in the corner called Pip, who, you know, eats up the pips on your dice, and as you get it to certain levels, it will score you some bonus points, you know, as a consolation, but it will also grant you the ability to mess around with the dice symbols. It's a nice little consolation prize if you can't use the actual die. Very simple though, 15 minutes you get through a game, nice and quick, simple roll and write, it was £9 at the stand, I played it once because I wanted to try it, liked it enough that I bought it, for £9, I mean it's so cheap, whether that was a special offer there or perhaps that's how much Harvest Dice is, but for a score pad and some coloured dice and pencils or whatever, it, it was just very charming. And even got a little pig miniature to go with it as the start player marker. You know, it's just very cutesy, very light, but I'm hoping that my girlfriend will like this one. So I bought it for nine quid. Here's some footage of how it plays. 
So you can't plant this tomato. Right. But you could plant one of these things of lettuce. Give me that. Uh, anyway, so, no, however they do the lettuce in this, but yeah. You can do it as a square, you could draw an L, it's really up to you. Okay. Hopefully. Uh, and then I get one more pick out of this. I'll take this two of lettuce. Cool. Tomatoes are left over. Yep. So now we're going to increase the value of tomatoes on our board. Pig passes to you. <laughs> and you're going to roll the dice. Hello, Pip. Good luck. And then you get first pick. Do 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 do. So tomatoes, so veg can only go next to each other in a sense. Exactly. So the t you could plant both of those tomatoes because you have a two spot open. Mm. You could plant this lettuce, or you could start planting carrots. You got plenty of room for carrots out here. Mm. Take right. the five. Take the five. I'm gonna take uh, lettuce. Not the best carrot, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, mine are okay, right? Okay. <laughs> Any case. All right. So I planted my lettuce there. Your play. Oh. Uh... Even do another one. Just, just stealing all those, huh? Steal all the carrots. I'm yep. gonna take uh, another lettuce. I'm gonna plant it right up here. Here's a lettuce patch. Next up, we have what was probably one of the more sought-after hotness of the expo, and that is Century Eastern Wonders. This is the second in the series by Plan B Games, where you originally had Century Spice Road, and. I'm ho-hum about Spice Road, I think it's a decent design game, but it's not one that grabs me. I prefer Splendor, but I can see it for what it is. Well, this is the second one in the lineup, and you can combine the two to have one epic version of, uh, you know, Century Spice Wonders, I guess. And wait, I didn't get to see that in action, because, to be honest, I don't have the first game, so I wasn't really that interested. And But the rule sheet was literally two sides of an A5 piece of paper. So... Can't be that tricky, and I reckon that if you have both games, I think you'll get a kick out of it. Now, Eastern Wonders is essentially Century Spice Road. It pretty much is. You know, you have a map full of these tiles, and each tile has an action that you go to, you build an outpost, and you get to do the action. The actions are exactly like they were on the cards before. Turn this many cubes into this other combination of cubes. You go to ports, trade in the cubes, get points, four ports ends the game, highest total wins. Pretty much identical. But it is better. One or two little additions make this a little bit more enjoyable. Firstly, you can also get points by building the outposts. And as you build the outposts in four different types of trade items, you can either get more points by building the same one multiple times, or if you build a variety, you can get special little bonus tiles that give you abilities for the rest of the game. It's pretty cool. I actually won the game mainly because I built a lot of those outposts. I didn't necessarily get the fourth port, but I was able to build so many houses that I overtook the other person in points. In addition, there's an, a, a chance to screw up other players by parking yourself where you think they want to go, so they give you tax, for, you know, tax cubes effectively. And there is a bit more of a spatial awareness to consider. You know, I need to do that, but that port's on the other side of the map. How do I get there? Should I go there via that space, or should I abandon it and try something else? There's a nice little bit of extra meat to this version. Now, I'm not interested in trying out the combination version. I feel like it would just be too long of a game of just pushing cubes around. And essentially, that's what this game is. It's just Century Spice Road with a spatial awareness. But it's a decent game. I think fans of Century Spice Road will like this one even more. Unless maybe you want the ultra simple version, in which case, take whichever one is your poison, really. But this was entertaining to play. Looks gorgeous. Nice and simple. Century Eastern Wonders. Next we have Ticket to Ride New York. This is the filler game brought out by Days of Wonder to be literally the 15 minute Ticket to Ride. Yeah, you are supposed to be able to un, you know, unpack and play and pack this away in around 15 minutes, 20 tops. This is the filler version. Most of the time Ticket to Ride takes about 45 minutes to an hour and this is meant to take a third of that time. That's a bold claim to make, so I had to find out what this was all about. Well, in this one, you're not using trains, you're using cabs, even though the cards use train, cab, buses, the whole lot. It's kind of weird. But you're basically doing the same thing. You connect routes up in New York City, you, you get the points on tickets, you get the colors like in Rummy, you play them, wait till someone's got two or less cars in front of them, and then you score up. Very much identical to Ticket to Ride. However, I was recording this when I was doing the, like, playing a game, and Literally, I think from start to finish, well, start to scoring up, took us about 
10 minutes and 20 seconds, I think, you know, to when we started scoring. And then I think the video I've got was about 12 minutes long, and that was two of us playing. So two of us, with me trying to do video footage and like trying to play the game with one hand and talking a lot, still got the game done in less than 15 minutes. So it does what it says on the tin, and I'll give it props for that. It's more portable. The component quality is okay. The cabs aren't as good as the trains we've had before, but they, they do, they do the trick. Smaller box, the board is fine, the cards are nice, you know, they're good quality and they're colorful. But my only thing with this is, who's the audience? Because if you want something for kids, you've got Ticket to Ride My First Journey, which isn't a portable game, but it's easier for kids. This one a kid can understand, but then why not use My First Journey? And gamers, do you want to play a 15 minute version of Ticket to Ride? Or are you like me where you would just prefer to play one of the multitude of expansions that are on my shelf? It's kind of weird. I don't desperately need a portable version of Ticket to Ride. However, there are going to be some people out there who do. So I think the game is good. I think it works. I think four players could easily do this in about 20 minutes if they know what they're doing. And four players would be pretty cutthroat as well. It's a small map. But yeah. If that's what you want, you know, a portable 15 minute ticket to ride, then this one does what it says on the tin and you should give it a look. Otherwise, I'll leave that up to you. But here's some footage nonetheless. Right. Right, well I'm gonna get started yep. straight away then. So, uh, two green, yep. two taxis, Wall Street, Soho. Because that's where you wanna go. <laughs> yep. Uh can play two pinks. Uh Scott Pile then. Uh to go. Greenwich Village to Gramercy Park. Gramercy Park. Oh, I see, that's where you like to go, is it? Huh. I mean uh Okay. I will stick to red. Uh -huh. Oh, you have got multicolored taxis. Uh -huh. There are some multicolored. Uh, I really like this gadget. Uh, to drop into uh, the Empire Six. So, as long as I don't give people motion sickness, I suppose there's anything with this. Um, I don't know where your finger is going. Uh, let's go one orange. Mm. My goodness, me! You gotta take a green. You didn't want to go to Times Square anyway, did you? Not anymore. <laughs> a, I got a poster on my wall for it. It's where I want to go. Whoop! Slight jitter there. Gotta try and remember what I've got cards-wise. You've just done those, you've just done those, right. Uh... The next two are going to be along a similar theme, and that's because the publishers of both are actually friends of each other, I found out. First up, I'm going to talk about the one that was my highlight of the whole expo. This was my favourite game I got to play in the whole expo, and that is Detective, a modern crime board game. This is the one done by Ignacy Trevacek and Portal Games, and they've been in development of this for a while. It's a two to three hour co-op deduction game where you're all playing essentially CSI, FBI, whatever, you know, agents, and you're trying to solve a case. I will not give spoilers because to do that would be a detriment to the game. But the quirk with this is that you have not only a bunch of cards with a lot of text on them to read, but they set out a really good story, very descriptive story in fact, even though you have to accept that they were blatantly not written by an English native speaker, but oh well, they're not they're not like horrible to read, it's just you can tell there's some grammatical changes in there that you wouldn't expect. But the quirk is that you have this website. You log on to the website, you have your own access, and then the cards have keywords that you type into this website, like names of people, finger fingerprint scan codes, etc. And when you type them into the desktop, it brings up like personnel files, details of who the fingerprints match. You know, if you have read up on this person and look up a fingerprint, it will tell you how much of a percentage match it is, where it is. There's uh, information on there. And there's even like little links to actual, you, know, you, you can't like click on the hyperlink, but 
the card will tell you to go look up this particular thing, like say, I don't know, I'll give an example, the, the battle of such and such place. And you know, you can look it up and you can go on Wikipedia and find out more about it. So you can learn a bit of history while you're playing this game. It's really neat. But I was the tech nerd and I was on there, you know, you know being the sort of geeky uh, CSI secretary effectively. But there were four of us. Um, we had Ben, um, I'm sorry, I forget what the name of his podcast was, but, um, you know, uh, here's a picture of him anyway, you can see it. But, you know, he was doing the reading of the cards and he should be his own audio book guy because he's very good at doing the voices and getting the ac funny accents and stuff. He was great at reading the cards and giving us that story. I also had Amy from the uh, game shelf there. You know, she was there doing a mind map because you really need to take notes in this game. But her mind mapping skills are somewhat to be desired. <laughs> I mean, I'm not exactly the best like handwriting person either, but by the time she'd drawn all these notes and that, it was almost like the, it was not so much a mind map, it's more of a mind maze. It was quite amusing trying to follow it, but you know, bless her, you know, they were useful notes and you certainly do need to take them. We also had uh, Mike Barnes from Who Dares Rolls, who was there mostly talking about food. <laughs> he was lending his uh, input in that, but a lot of the cards went into weird detail about what we were having for lunch or the fact that so-and-so made a cup of tea and didn't make us one. So we basically started latching onto that gag and you know, constantly referencing about food. You know, when we finish each day of the uh, of the case, we're like, you know, what do you want to get? You know, um, Chinese curry, you know, we can get that. You know, we should order it in. It would be more realistic. And it was a good laugh, but the game itself is solid. I mean, if you like co-op deduction games, that feel like there's more of a coherent story and more of a, not a linear path, but more guidance as to what you should do, this is definitely one to check out. I mean, I like Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, but you find that that one is a massive sandbox. You don't know where the first place is you should try it in that game. Here, you have some pointers, but there's a lot of ways you can do it. There's a lot of stuff we never found out. I mean, I kid you not, I think the deck was about this big for cards in general, for like the first case, and I think there's six in the box. Oh no, I think there's five in the box, and there's a sixth one if you pre-order it, but again, they can just add expansion content later. This is infinitely like, you know, expandable. And the playtime that will take you is about the same as a pandemic legacy campaign. So those of you saying that it's, oh, it's only one use and you'll eventually get bored of it. Hell, hello, it worked with pandemic legacy, it can work with this one, so enough. But we had a card uh, count about this big to begin with, and I think we had about yay big. <laughs> I know you can't hear this on audio, but put it this way, I think there was still a quarter of that deck at least, maybe even a third of it, that we hadn't read. And we got through a lot in those, what, two and a half hours tops we played the game, you know, before we finally tried to solve the case. And Ignacity, being Ignacity, wouldn't even let us read the epilogue. You know, so we have to play this again. We don't know how it ended. We don't even know how well we did. We had a percentage score, but we don't know whether that was good. We don't know what questions we got wrong. So this is, gives us a chance to replay it and try different tactics. But wow. I mean, the, the desktop is not a gimmick. It works well. It makes you feel like one of those CSI Miami shows, you know, with the overarching conspiracy theory plot. You know, you can almost have theme music in the background. You can't play this at a game club though. You need to concentrate, you need to be on the ball, you need to be talking with each other. This is not for a game club night. You need to invite people around your house, you know, and have a TV, have the PC there, you know, and have a peace and quiet. It worked brilliantly in Ignacity's hotel room, and I recommend a similar thing, you know, a lounge or a, a quiet game room to play this, but wow. This was my highlight, this was my favorite game of the expo, bar none. I cannot wait to see this out. If I get a chance to pre-order it, I will. Whew. Detective, a modern crime board game. This has the, the potential to hit big. Now with Detective, a modern crime board game, I didn't have any video footage because, well, they were keeping it fairly hush-hush. I didn't want to give spoilers. So all I have is pictures, as you would have seen. This one though, I do have some video footage for, and that is Chronicles of Crime. This is the other detective co-op deduction game and I believe the publisher or designer is a friend of Ignacity's. So they have both already discussed the fact that they've got similar games, but after playing both of them, they do scratch the same itch, but they tackle it in different ways and they both feel different to each other. One is clearly going for a different market than the other one. So you could own both. 
and I'm almost tempted to, because I enjoyed this one quite a bit as well, subject to a few irritations. Chronicles of Crime is, again, you are a bunch of FBI agents and you're trying to solve a case with an interesting storyline. Except the gimmick with this one is that you have cards for locations and people and items, and they all have these QR codes on them. And the idea is, is that you scan it with your phone and it gives you the text on the screen by an app. You can also look through a crime scene by using these VR goggles or just looking at your you know, phone in panoramic mode, more on that later. But essentially it's a bit like the one I just mentioned. You're trying to solve a case, you talk to people, you use your assets, you review items, you make clues, and eventually you try and solve the case via some multi-choice questions. Much in the same vein as Detective. But this one definitely is a lot quicker to play. It is probably easier in terms of figuring out the case compared to the other one. You don't have to read into as much detail. But here's where it starts to slip a little bit in comparison to the other one. And I'm sure they can iron out some of these wrinkles by the time it releases because I don't think it was a full-fledged copy. Firstly, in fact, everything's all to do with the app <laughs> because the app has some issues. Firstly, when you look over that crime scene, it is so easy, even in panoramic mode, to miss out vital clues. And if you miss out that vital clue, then you'll go off on a tangent somewhere, you'll waste time, your score will be low, and you won't realize you've done it. It's a bit of a pain. And it's worse if you use the VR goggles, because in there, some of these things will become blurred and you won't be able to make out whether that's an important thing or not. Because you're too, you have to look at this and you've only got 45 seconds to do it in, so you bizarrely have a timer, I don't get why and your teammates have to look for all these cards and try and pick out the stuff you're talking about. The problem is you need to review all those cards before you look at the crime scene because otherwise you don't know what you should be talking about or looking for. So I'm hoping they'll make that a little bit more streamlined, a little bit less fiddly, and a lot less able to completely go off the rails if you make a mistake. Secondly, and this is the biggest irritation, and I hope to God they fix it. Basically, when you talk to a person, you have the ability to say goodbye. But when you're talking to that person and you scan anything else, it's like you're talking to that person about the item or that person or that location. The problem is, is that you keep constantly forgetting to say goodbye. You have to press a button on the app to say goodbye to the person. So you'll get a piece of information and you'll be like, oh yeah, we could talk to the scientists about this, scan. And you realize you've just talked to the person you're still talking to about the scientist they've never met. It is frustrating when you do it once or twice. It is anger inducing when you do it six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. Constantly we were doing it and each time you're wasting valuable time, wasting points. I hope there's a simpler way of reminding you to say goodbye to someone or that they give you like an are you sure prompt or something because it was far too easy to forget that you're still talking to that person. You know, quibbles with the app that I'm sure can be resolved by the time it gets released. But, you know, other than that, I thought this was a solid co-op deduction game. Chronicles of Crime, you know, here's some footage to uh, tie you over. But this is definitely attacking an audience where they need shorter play length, easier rules, you know, easier cases, even though they're not like that easy. But, yeah, basically the shorter, lighter version of Detective and Modern Crime board game. See what you think. Well, he might, I mean, I don't know. Right? I, mean, I think an, aut an autopsy might not be a bad idea, though, because it yeah. took several minutes for her to die. So exactly, if it took several minutes for her to die, I'm not sure the shovel was used. Yeah, although we could have that looked at by the scientist as well if we need to. We could do. Let's try to do it. Let the doctor have his work, so. Do the body first, or do that first? Uh, it's supposed to be about her, right? The body. Yeah, how do we scan? So if we want to do an autopsy on body, do we just use yeah, so that QR? You, are... you just need to call the doctor first, so to scan the doctor, and then you may ask him about anything. So you, then you scan the uh, victim's body to ask the doctor about the victim's body. Okay. Um, you have called the morgue. Do you have a body for me? And then you, yeah, then you point it yeah, at this poor lady. It was Emile. Emile Gerard. 
We now move on to Reef, and there is not much I can say about this game apart from show you the footage. This is a new game in the works by Immersion Matsuchi, I think his name is. Same bloke who did the Century series. This is another gateway game by technically Plan B Games, but this is their new publishing branch called Next Move. The idea is that this is going to be gateway level games that all have four letter words as their title. Kind of weird, because wasn't Plan B already doing gateway level games? Hard to say really, but Reef is the first one. And what you are doing is that you are drawing a card and playing cards. Pretty simple, but what you're doing with these cards is you're collecting these reef segment pieces of different colors and you're placing them on this grid map. And you can place them in separate spaces or you can pile them on top of each other. You play a card and the top half tells you which segments to pick up. The bottom half gives you a chance to score points based on how your like you know coral reef is looking. It's so simple, that's all you do. Pick up cards, play cards, get segments, score points, Wait until one of the segment uh, blocks has completely depleted. And that's it. So simple. There's not much more I can explain. It is that simple a gateway game. But there's some good tactical depth, turns are really quick, there's very little downtime. And what did it take us? 15 to 20 minutes to play a free player game once we got the rules down? So simple. And it's so colourful that it just pops. I This is probably the second favourite game I played at the expo. And keep an eye on it. Because this has the potential to hit big as a great gateway game and when this gets released if i have to admit if it continues to be as good as it is if this doesn't get nominated for spiel de yaris then i am calling foul on the spiel awards because this is a game that i played where i thought this could be a spiel de yaris nominee possibly even a winner it's that well geared to families check out this footage and see what you think my lovely reef it's not my turn Please. You're right, this is the one that Tom Vassell actually, like he was saying at the booth yesterday, he played this, demoed this, and said it was better than Sentry. And he likes Sentry a lot. <laughs> well, it's fun by the same guy though, and it is another one of those like, play a card, do stuff. <laughs> it's like... Alright, I'm gonna... Ooh, maybe I should grab that card first. Yes. I suppose I gotta watch the uh, colours as well though, because they're gonna go down. The fun bit though, it comes like ticket to ride or so when I'm trying to manipulate a hand of cards with one hand so I don't ruin the base. <laughs> Alright, I need I need you. That card will be mine. <laughs> Oh! Okay, two more games. Uh, first up, we'll go very quickly on to Agricola, All Creatures Great and Small, The Big Box. Some of you have already played this game, so I won't dwell on this too much, but basically they're now releasing Agricola, All Creatures Great and Small in a kind of a big box version, and basically it will have the base game and two expansions. They're all together, nicely organized, much easier with some upgraded components as well. But with this game, it's the two player version of Agricola. You are building a farm, you're building this, uh, it's not so much in the way of growing, you're building pastures and getting lots of different animals, building fences and you know, upgrading your house, getting some buildings. The special buildings can change from the game to game. It's a simple two player worker placement game. It's a very cool little game. It's definitely a lighter version of Agricola, not as punishing, but has that cool feel of put the little pastures out and collect the little animals and stuff. You know, it's really cutesy, but I really like it. And, you know, having a big box version means that you can now have all those special buildings and you only use a few in each game. So all your games can be really varied. I look forward to getting this in a nice big box edition. But check out this footage for more info. All right, I'm going to the wood. Wah. Yeah, might. Well, you can never have too much wood. I'm going with one of each. You can go with one of each. Which is fine, once per action. Oh yeah, to build a stall. I'm gonna... I'm gonna go grab some stone. Let's 
big collection of resources. Hey. I'm going Difficult. Yeah, take the stones. You'll take the stones. Right, I'm gonna. Hold in. I have half a timbered house. Giant, giant, awesome oh, house. All the stuff which you could possibly afford now as well, so I was a little bit like, no. Actually, no, um, no you need the wood for that. But I wanted to, yeah, I want to take the big house. Worry about the farm in a minute, but you can have you can have another horsey in there. So. Am I going to build a stall? Stay. Yes, stall. And finally for this video, and there may be occasional other videos I put up on the playlist of other games I'm not mentioning in this review, we'll have to wait and see, but I don't want this video to go on too long, so you know, we need to wrap it up eventually. The last one I'm going to talk about though is The Troubled Life of Billy Kerr, I think it's called Holding On, The Troubled Life of Billy Kerr. This is by Hub Games, and I rag on a lot of publishers about, oh, I want to see more innovation in games, why can't you come up with new ideas and new ways of doing things? Well, somebody answered my call and came up with The Troubled Life of Billy Kerr. This is a co-op game with, with cards. Um, basically, a 60-something-year-old patient has come into the ward with heart attacks. He's called Billy Kerr, and you're trying to save his life. This is played through a card deck that has 10 scenarios in it. Each one apparently plays very differently. But throughout these 10 scenarios, you're living a story, you're getting an insight into this patient, what his life was like, it's based on pseudo-history, you know, there are real events, even though this guy is a fictional character, and it's kind of, it's not, it's semi-legacy, I mean, you don't destroy any components, but once you've played through it, you know the story, but you could give it to someone else and watch them play through it, and, you know, at the end of the day, you'll be playing for the same amount of time as a Pandemic Legacy game, so, can't really say bad things about that, you'll get your money's worth out of the game. But the idea is, is that you flip cards over onto this little uh, board and they will have either emergencies or things that you can do with the patient and you have to react to them. You have shift managers, you take it in turn, you have meeple assistants and stuff and you have to allocate the meeples in such a way with the limited resources you have to try and keep them alive. His health will deteriorate, but in the first scenario, what you're trying to do is find out more about his next of kin, so you're trying to piece together his memories. And the idea is, is that you collect these cards from different uh, parts of his life that all have partial memories. And the artwork's really nice. It kind of blurs out the outside of the picture but hones in on a specific element. So you might see a, a, a boy holding hands with someone, having a play. But you don't know who he's holding hands with, you don't know where they are. And, you know, I won't spoil any more than that. But you then find the clear memories that overlap them. And you say, ah, oh, that's the memory and there's nice flavor text, and generally it's a very interesting little story. I have a feeling that this is gonna be one that's gonna tug at the emotion centers when you get to the later scenarios, and not every scenario is like this. I mean, the first scenario you have to find out about his next of kin, piece together the memories, and you win that scenario. The other nine scenarios I've been told are fairly different, and everything you need is in those cards and in the box. So it's not like you have to get extra components. I'm a little bit, concerned as to whether the co-op aspect of this is going to be as good as it can be or not because when I was playing it I was enjoying it but I didn't feel like I needed the other players there. I felt that this could have just been easily done as a solo game but if that's the case no problem I like solo games and I would happily play this one solo only if that was the, if that turned out to be the way to do it but as innovation goes this is something different. I haven't seen this type of game before it's unique it was entertaining. I feel that this is going to be a good story as you go through. I'm excited to see this one when I think it comes out around Essen. So Troubled Life, the Troubled Life, sorry, the Holding On, the Troubled Life of Billy Kerr. Too long of a name, hate it. But, you know, it's certainly a unique game and I'll look out for it. Here's some footage of how it plays. 
and I'll jump in when I need to sort of like give you the guiding hand. So, shift managers, please reveal your next card. So, round two, we have one tear token available. Yeah. That's all great. Uh, no, I got this thing. Oh, two. Oh, it's nice to yeah. get in there. There's one there, there's one there. You're okay. <laughs> this time I'm saying what I want to say, not what my shift manager tells me to say. <laughs> Uh, it's Mike. Yeah. Mike. Mike. Uh, so you're shuffle. Well, it depends on what you're doing. Yeah. Well, it's the uh, next. Oh yeah, true. Mm -hmm. Is it not the you have to make a choice between these two? Is it? Yeah. So you choose. Yeah. yeah. We, well, we need some cards. So how about we get yeah. some card on the table? <laughs> And it is only one. It's only one. Let's get a card on the table because we're kind of short on them. <laughs> Remember, you do need to do medical attention at least once a day. So that actually might be a good one to do it on. Because if you have a better card later down the line, you might want a better reward. Good, good okay, actually, yeah, fair point. Should we just do, we just do the There, there, Billy, you sleep uh, now. Yes, <laughs> yeah. right, right after we've interrogated you for information. Yeah, well, now we can just get the card next. It's already done. Yeah. Yeah, what do you want to do? Yeah. It's up to you. It's up to you. You're the, you're the nurse. You're the nurse. We've already cared. We've, we've already cared for him once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> NHS doesn't pay us to do it twice. Yeah, yeah. We've done the bare minimum for the day, so you don't. You actually don't need to do it anymore today. So now, please, can we draw it not on the event? I need some footage of it. <laughs> So yeah, if it's a yellow one and you spend the token for it, he goes up by one. Yes, I'm a guardian. We've got text. <laughs> you knew you were asking for trouble, okay, so, but you know what? We as didn't you're all care. Responsible for the person, and we're the next person around the table. So Marissa, we knew we were asking for trouble, but you know what? We didn't care. <laughs> so the reason we ask people to show Alright, that doesn't flip yet. So he's just down one by the way. Same things again and again. It does, again. doesn't it? Yeah. Hopefully, maybe. Yeah, that's how we try it. And then. Woohoo! Hey! <laughs> well done. <laughs> oh, joy. So this is a green quiet moment. Every assistant on the planet. It's not like I have much choice. <laughs> Yeah, because you're always going to shop. You can do right? that, right? Oh, oh. Alright, so remember, people have been allocated here. Uh, who is the red one? Okay, so uh, did you take the bonus token? Remember, take it immediately where people have been allocated. Yeah, because you might need every single one possible. Okay? If we don't do anything, do we get a warning? Or is it if we no, don't no, do anything? No, 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 no. You've done your bare minimum for the, the day, you've the got your cover on there. Yeah. He'll drop by four. But that's okay. Yeah. We could spend that and he'll drop by three. It seems better used as elsewhere. Yeah. Alright, so. Yeah. Yes, you have to. So, uh, Billy did not survive. <laughs> so. Right, that's it, guys. This is going to be one hell of a video to edit. It really is, because I've got to put him. You know, B-roll footage, I've got to put in actual videos, I've got to do the pictures. I got a lot to talk about in this video and that wasn't even everything I did. There were other games I played, maybe you'll see them on the playlist on the YouTube channel in time, depending if I've got videos for them. But otherwise, I can't talk about everything, so I had to basically pick out the major highlights based on what was going on. So again, the UK Games Expo. A triumph as always, I've enjoyed it in the, what, three or four years now I've been to it. Uh, I think this will be the third year I've done it, possibly the fourth, but I enjoy it each time. You will see me again there next year for the whole event. No questions asked. I've already booked the accommodation, so I am set. This is a great convention to go to. You, everybody who came to say hi and that, you're all wonderful people. All of you that go to the expo, you're all great people. Love the publishers, love the designers, love all the games. Great convention. It's sad to return to reality, but unfortunately... We all kind of have to at some point. Oh well, I'll see you at Essen anyway. So that's it for the UK Games Expo review. Hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you enjoy the other stuff that I put on the channel in good time. Hope you're enjoying all the other stuff that's been on the channel in the last uh, week or so. All the uh, top 100 co-op games with Jason Perez from Every Night is Game Night. I highly recommend you watch those videos. It was a great laugh with me and him on Google Hangouts talking through these games. 
Uh, there's the Top 10 Turkey should be out any day now if it isn't already. There's reviews for the uh, Arkham Horror LCG expansion, the Sanctum of Twilight Mansions and Madness expansion, the Crypto, and of course, games that I bought at the Expo. I will try to do some reviews on some of those, maybe the newer ones rather than old stuff that you've already heard of, but we'll see how that goes. There's plenty to come in the future. And of course, eventually, yeah, you know it's coming. We're getting to midsummer, the end of summer, which means top 100 games of all time. Yes, I'm going to have to redo that list. I better get started on uh, collating my... I want to play some of these games from the Expo first, in case they could make the list. But yeah, sooner or later I'll be doing that list. There'll be another 10 videos for that. So I hope you look forward to those as well. That's it for me on this episode, special episode, in fact, of The Broken Meeple. See you next time. If you like what you see, subscribe to the podcast, the YouTube channel, or just get in touch with me on Facebook and Twitter. But whatever you do, whatever convention you go to, whatever games you're playing, just remember, as always, as I always say, remember, it's only a game. Take care, enjoy, and have fun gaming. See you next time. <laughs>